Good evening. I am Uday Bhaskar. Welcome to Wide Angle. This is a program that seeks to provide an informed and objective view of contemporary developments that have a bearing on national security, international affairs, and related subjects. Today, we will discuss the Henderson Brooks Report. This is related to the 1962 Sino Indian border war and was kept under wraps by the government of the day and still remains classified almost 60 years later. In recent days, this has come into the public gaze since some parts of the report have been released through a personal blog of a journalist, Mr. Neville Maxwell, who had covered this war for a UK newspaper and subsequently wrote a book on the subject. While the Henderson Brooks report has definitely created a bit of a flutter, it does not really reveal anything which was not earlier known to the professionals and to experts who were looking at the subject. To discuss this today, we have a very, very eminent panel. I have Mr. Amita Pandey, who was a Joint Secretary in the Ministry of Defense and subsequently a Secretary to the Government of India. Lieutenant General Satish Nambiar, a former Director General Military Operations and later Deputy Chief of the Army Staff. And we are also joined by Mr. Zoravar Dalat Singh, a researcher at the King's College London, who has been working both on the 1962 war and the Sino-Indian relationship, and also has a very interesting personal linkage with the subject, meaning that his grandfather, Lieutenant General Dalat Singh, was the GOC in C, the General Officer Commanding in Chief of the Western Command at that time. Zoravar, if I could start with you as a researcher, and let me add that all three members on the panel have actually read that part of the Henderson Brooks report, which is currently in the public domain. If you could perhaps give us an overview of the Henderson Brooks report and what are the salient features? Because the received wisdom is that the mandate given to Lieutenant General Brooks was to look at the tactical aspects. What were the inadequacies in the army from command level downwards? But we are aware that the scope of the report had also been extended by the principal authors. So could you place this into context for us, Zorava? Thank you. That's right. So when, uh, when um, Lieutenant General um, Henderson and uh, Bhagat were asked to prepare a report, they were given a very narrow mandate to focus on the operational and tactical aspects, focusing on the eastern sector, that is Arunachal Pradesh today. But what happened eventually was they, uh, out of their own initiative, sought to also convey some of the strategic aspects and the policy-making aspects, and particularly uh, how the higher command operated and managed this war. Now, they were really constrained. They did not have access to the political archives. They did not also have access to army headquarters. So they had to actually reconstruct the narrative, relying on archives available in the regional commands, that is Western Army Command and Eastern Army Command. And given that uh, sort of constraint, we see that they've actually uh, done a remarkable job in at least providing us a big strategic picture of what transpired preceding the war and actually uh, during the war. Uh, the salient features, uh, if you ask me, are really that uh, they, 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 they have, take a critical look at the higher defense management, the intelligence system, the, the policy monitoring process once the forward policy is in play, how a failure to reassess it when new information came into light, the actual conduct of the commanders on the ground and how there was that disconnect between people on the ground and army headquarters. So it, it really shows a, not so much civil military relations, but intra-military sort of uh, uh, tensions that play out. And something and that you would describe as perhaps relevant to the army in terms of its own internal institutional processes. Let me take this to General Nambiar. General Nambiar, you've been a DGMO, and my own recall is that, at least in the public domain, it was always believed that there were two copies of the report. One which was kept with the Defense Secretary in the Ministry, and the other in Army Headquarters with the DGMO. So I'm presuming that immediately after the 1962 war, and subsequently, the DGMO 
and other members in the staff may have actually looked at the report. So two questions to you. One, did you read this report before it came into the public domain in your professional capacity? And how did the army use this post-62? You know, what lessons did the army derive from it? Well, let, let me put it this way. Firstly, the contents of the report uh, and, and, you know, having been put out in the public domain was done very much earlier in 1970, long before I went anywhere uh, near uh, the military operations directorate. The first time I went to the military operations directorate was as a young major, of course, in 1969 uh, after my staff college. But at that time, this aspect was never, you know, I mean, I'd, one didn't even think of it or was told about it. But the first time I, I should, uh, when I became aware of the report was when I was uh, number two in the military operations directorate, the additional director general of military operations in N89 or so, I think, when we were pulling out of Sri Lanka and uh, uh, the then chief, General Sharma, had tasked me to get hold of this report, study it, to analyze and put up a, an analysis as to whether lessons of the 1962 war had been <coughs> put to effect or put to use in our, let's say, our commitment in uh, operational Lanka. power in, in Sri Lanka. At that time, uh, we did not have a copy of the report in the military operations directorate. I had to get it from uh, one of his colleagues in the uh, in the Ministry of Defense, the Joint Secretary G, uh, then the late Mr. Chatterjee. And I got hold of that report and read it. So I have read the report uh, in its original form, not uh, as, you know, on the net, uh, Neville Maxwell's sort of uh, presentation. But, uh, I mean, while I will not speak of the contents of the report, I'll just make one or two observations in that regard in context of the, uh, of, uh, the co sort of questions you've raised. Firstly, I think that panel, uh, General Henderson Brooks, uh, Brigadier Bhagat, General, then Brigadier, uh, were tasked to, to, to analyze the operational preparedness, basically, of the armed forces. Now, inevitably, when you're talking of the, uh, the operational preparedness, they had to get down to brass tacks, interview people who had actually been through the war, various commanders and at, at various levels, and, and go through documents that were available to them. And in that process, they would obviously have had to analyze the directions given to commanders at various levels in terms of the task that they did. And that is why they would have gone beyond the, uh, the initial remit that was given to them. And it's therefore not surprising that they would have commented on, on certain political aspects, they would have commented on certain diplomatic aspects. Intelligence. And, and most certainly yeah. on intelligence and on a higher direction of, of war. So that I think is something which uh, comes out clearly in that report. And I would only conclude here by saying that uh, this part of the analysis, which I did at the instance of the then chief, uh, brought out that the lessons uh, of the 1962 operations had not been learned in so far as ap applying them to, uh, Sri Lanka, to Sri Lanka was concerned, particularly in regard to uh, and the, and the aspects that really struck me which I'll mention only two or three of them. One was the lack of clear political, uh, shall we say, direction, uh, and direction or rather uh, a, a perspective of what was intended to be achieved. The second was, I think, the lack of coordinated intelligence, uh, intelligence even some of the agencies working at cross purposes. And lastly, in, in, in terms of uh, an operational, you know, from the army or the armed forces point of view, the fact that the micromanagement of the operational ground level stuff being done from Delhi, from Delhi. was again repeated in, in Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka. And to our, obviously yeah. to the disadvantage If of I could request process. you to pause here, let me come to Mr. Pandey. You know, clearly now from what General Nambiar is telling us, Army headquarters and the DGMO's staff clearly had been consulting this report when required. Now two questions for you. One, from your experience, do you recall that the Ministry of Defense at whatever level would have actually seen this report? for lessons learned or otherwise? And secondly, how would you characterize the reluctance of the government to bring this into the public domain? Because I know as a researcher in the early 90s, we had made a very earnest request to the Ministry of Defense saying that this is a report that should come out into the public domain. And we were talking about a period which was 30 years after the war. Mm. But the government of the day at that time, led by Mr. Narasimha Rao, chose not to bring it into the public domain. So these two areas, how would you characterize? Well, firstly, I haven't dealt with either the operational aspects of military 
at any stage, nor have I dealt with this report, nor am I aware of what really what uh, systems or what decision making goes on into classifying or declassifying information. But based on my general experience, there are two or three things which I want to say. One, poor quality of uh, how decisions are taken at the higher level. Uh, partly because the decision making was confined to a coterie of high powered individuals rather than through the established processes of where decision making filters through the hierarchy of the uh, system. So that different levels get to bear, apply their minds on, on, a, uh, on a particular issue. That process was completely ignored, it seems, by a few high powered individuals coming together and taking a somewhat whimsical uh, uh, approach to decision making. And I think much of that continues even today. Okay. Uh, secondly, it's, uh, it's this obsession with, secure, uh, obsession with secrecy. This it's a peculiarity of, I think, particularly of the Ministry of Defense, but certainly peculiarity of the government as, uh, of the as day, a yeah. whole, uh, that you may continue to maintain uh, information as secret. Whereas you know, A, that the ministry leaks like a sieve. So all information to those who want to misuse that information is easily available because you, you pay for that information, you get whatever information you want. <coughs> Two, by, by making the information so secret, those, those who can use the information usefully are prevented from, yeah. are denied from uh, accessing that information. So this is a very unhealthy system and I hope something can be done to change that. So in short, I mean, there is a very strong case for reports of this nature to be brought into the public domain. Now, this is a recommendation that has been made many times, but I'll come back to both of you on this. But Zoravar, if I could come back to you again, you know, given your perch as a researcher, General Nambiar spoke about the fact that the lessons that could have been derived from 1962 as contained in the Henderson Brooks report clearly were also coming back into focus in the case of Sri Lanka and Op Pawan. Now one could say that Cargill in many ways reflects the same institutional inadequacies. So I'd like you to actually think about this and you know give us a sense about the current status of higher defense management in India as you see it as a researcher, somebody who studied 62, who is familiar with Cargill and where we are now. What I find uh, the other thing that comes out from the report by inference is the, the civil military sort of uh, the structures and how we simply have been unable to adapt them, reform them to both an era where we have nuclear weapons and also far more sophisticated military technological environments. So, what you see in, let's say, the, uh, what the Henderson books were studying is you have a forward policy that has been decided by the political leadership. It is given to the military leadership who in turn interpret it selectively and then that sort of progressively leads to problems later on. Now, if the system were working uh, more efficiently, the civilian leadership should have been monitoring this process better the military leadership as well should have been also reassessing and reappraising based on information that was coming from inside the system below. So now it's, uh, it's unclear uh, how much improvement has happened on that front, but certainly the civil military aspects simply have not changed. And, and in India, you really have a situation where, yes, supremacy over the military arm is absolutely vital to protect uh, and secure a democratic system. But uh, what's happened in India is it's gone to the stage of domination and trying to keep the military sort of at an arm's length. And that's led to two uh, suboptimal outcomes. You have the civilian leadership today and back then, which is creating and producing and conceptualizing security policies without actually available information from the professional military. And you have the military arm that has been left to its own devices to cultivate sort of parochial thinking and bureaucratic thinking from within. So we, that's we clearly a lesson that I see can be drawn from, from HBR. You know, civil military is something that Wide Angle has been looking at it consistently. But we'll come back in a moment. We'll take a short break. Keep watching. We'll be back soon.